Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts. I'm just thinking, so Vincent was telling us behind the scenes that this book has been out for a year. Um, so we were supposed to have him on, I guess. We could, we could have had him on a year ago. Um... Which I'm thinking now, man, we should have done that because Vincent is a complete, you know, he's a complete character. We, we, you know, if you're looking for things to do in your retirement here, I don't know what you're getting up to. We, uh, you know, we might, uh, we might invite you back here. And by the way, what, what are you, what are you drinking over there, Vincent? Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels. Okay. Um, this so you <laughs> probably didn't pick up on that in the book that I'm somewhat of a. <laughs> Jack Daniels aficionado. Uh, well, uh, right here, there's totally alcohol. So uh, okay, I'm gonna show you something. Hold on, hold tight, real uh, quick. Uh, uh, see if I can do this. Okay, let's see. No. <laughs> okay. Is that uh, a like shrine to to, <laughs> to Jack Daniels? Is, is that what that is, Patrick? I wouldn't even realize that. Okay. That's a statue of Jack Daniels. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, you're for reals. <laughs> I didn't even know, Patrick, you knew that. I didn't even realize. Well, I, I, I kind of recognize I, I like my Jack a little bit, but oh. yeah, I kind of recognize <laughs> Wow. Hank, uh, if you're not aware, Hank is not a drinker, <laughs> at, like, at all. Yeah. So, uh, like, not I, that he opposes it, it's just, no. I believe, Hank, you said it puts you to sleep, so you never drink anything. Yeah, you know, that's the thing that probably kept me alive. Like, I don't, like, drugs and all that kind of stuff, the coffee puts me to sleep, Alcohol puts me to sleep, you know. I'm crazy like this with nothing. It's just, I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm wired wrong or something like that. So, um, yeah, so this is... Natural high. You got natural high, bro. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Patrick, do you have any questions here? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just enjoying the conversation. <laughs> uh, when, when something pops up, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Yeah. So can you tell us where you are now? You're, you're retired, right? I'm retired. I'm in Tri Cities, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Bought a lake house. Okay. I hunt. I fish. I drink heavily. <laughs> <laughs> so, so being in retirement and having put many a many a folk away, do you do you have to like watch your back at all? Do you feel like at any moment there could be you know it could be your time somebody could come try to find you? Um, no. What? You know what? I kind of. I was raised with a bunch of uh, old treasury revenuer dudes, and those guys, those were some courageous dudes. They'd go out in the woods and stay for three, four days at a time waiting to bust a still. Mm -hmm. oh. So, you know, I, I, I was raised in this job by some really, really talented police officers and federal agents. Um, and one of the things I realized early on, if you ain't got a stomach for it, don't do it. Mm -hmm. you yeah, know, I, I guess so. there's a risk. We've had agents attacked. We've had, you know, things happen, threats made and what have you. But I'm easy to find. But there better be more than 30 of you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah. One of the, By the way, shout out to Razor JB. I see, I see uh, Razor out there. Um uh, Razor JB says schedule his next appearance already. <laughs> 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 Listen, if uh, I, we could definitely fit you in, man, we do this. We do this like uh, Monday to Friday over here. So, what kind of in in your career? That that question that Patrick just asked, I thought was a good one. In your career, what kind of bust did you make? Because I know that folks tuning in and seeing this as an ATF agent, they're probably wondering. You know, were you going after the guys like us, gun guys? I know that we don't have, we don't have lots of good opinions about the ATF around here. I got modern mm -hmm. ATF is is a dirty word to us right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, so. um, we earned it. We've earned it with some of our chicanery. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you this: um, I worked everything. Literally, I could get up in the morning and not have a clue. I could have a deal done by that day. Mm -hmm. A hand to hand with uh, some gangster for some dope or guns or bombs or who knows what, some white supremacist or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, or I could get a phone call 
um, as happened, and I was in Vegas for six months, mm. you know, with no notice. Hey, love your wife, love your kids. Um, see you when I see you. Mm. And, uh, you know, that turned out to be a long term, very complicated, deep undercover operation. Okay. Um, so was it but like, so is far, it? Wait a minute. Okay. Wait a minute. Okay. I do want to address the one thing you mm -hmm. asked. Mm -hmm. Do we go after folks like you? Mm -hmm. I never, ever sent an innocent person to prison. Now, that being said, and I mentioned it in the book, mm -hmm. I was asked on several occasions to press the envelope. Somebody, there was a Vietnam veteran. He brought back uh, AK that he took off of some North Vietnamese army guy or a Viet Cong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Killed him, took his weapon. Spoils of war. It, shipped mm -hmm. it back. Problem was they did away with the uh, the war trophies mm -hmm. act and mm -hmm. what have you. Mm -hmm. So it was technically illegal. Mm -hmm. It was mounted on his mantle and the barrel had been welded shut. Okay. It was okay. Special Forces, a Green Beret in Vietnam. The guy was but, a Green Beret? Yes. Okay. And his wife and him were getting divorced, mm -hmm. and she got a case and notified the local police, who mm -hmm. notified ATF that this guy has a fully operational machine gun in his house, blah, blah, blah. And so I was tagged to do the undercover, and I went and I met the guy and I saw what we were talking about and I went back and they said, all right, we need to do a search warrant. You go in and we'll do the search warrant. You get him talking about the gun and everything. I said, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. This is if there was ever a case for an abandonment, which is a procedure in ATF. If you come, your grandpa dies and you find a machine gun in his attic and you don't want it. But you'd abandon it to ATF and no harm, no foul. And we just destroy it or do whatever we do with it. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought this is a perfect case for an abandonment. War hero, Silver Star, I believe. Um, and we went to war. And I just said, I'm not doing it. I will not do it. And I'll testify in his behalf if the case comes to court. This is bull. Mm -hmm. And the bosses finally backed down and sent the agents out to take an abandonment, which was kind of sad to me. I mean, mm -hmm. the guy earned the trophy, but it was better than going to prison and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Was that, so was we, that destroyed? We don't, after, we don't go after guys like you. Mm -hmm. We go after guys that are out there killing people, planning do do harm to people. Yeah. Um, so, okay, there's a couple of things there. Len Holt says, uh, is it safe to say Vincent was on the enforcement side over policy side of the ATF. Um, yes, I was absolutely enforcement. Um, policy would have come in if I had promoted up through the boss system, but there came a point where I decided I was not going to go that route because I mm -hmm. couldn't stand shoulder to shoulder with some of the policies. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to be a boss, be a boss. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't concur with some of the things, some of the ways ATF was going. So I chose to be a street agent my whole career. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I, I got to respect that. <laughs> Not everyone wants to be a grunt the whole time, right? At some point, people decide, hey, I want to wear the nice fancy suits and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? In, in all actuality, mm -hmm. there was sort of a mantra throughout ATF. Um, the highest grade you can get as a street agent is a GS-13. That's mm -hmm. a pay grade is all. Mm -hmm. But that's the highest you can get as an agent, not being a boss. And everybody to a person that I knew and respected that I worked with said, GS-13 for life. You start getting into the policy part of ATF, you start selling your soul just because of the way the agency was constructed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's, a, like, that's a tough line, right, Patrick, to, to walk here? Because I yeah. think we... we we, we rant on the ATF. I mean, we've done it recently. Yeah, so do you did you feel like there was... Is there kind of a disconnect between the, the foot soldiers and the guys making policy? Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely, and we're so including the policy making mm -hmm. because there are so many field agents out there. There, there are icons of ATF that are out there. Just Google them. There's some like no heroes and guys who have made, you know, blockbuster cases. And nobody ever came to them. Nobody ever said, look, we're getting ready to adjust our firearms policy or our enforcement policies. What do you guys think about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the big problem. Yeah, I think the big problem. Always knew better. Trust yeah. me. I think a big problem over at the ATF is the, polis the politics side of it. And mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that the people at the top tend to be political appointments, right? So sometimes, well, you know, you got the wrong guys in there or they're trying to dismantle maybe the Second Amendment versus like you, you're you saying you guys were going after the bad guys that were using guns. And, and I mean, ATF is more than just guns, right? So it's alcohol, tobacco, firearms. Well, and fire explosives. Includes, and explosives, yeah. arsons and bombings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what was the, what was, so enforcement or undercover work that you did was that I know in the book you talk about uh, back in the days I guess the you know the first wave of guys were going after the moonshiners, right or the or alcohol because that you know which to me that's a politics thing right there, you know why did they make alcohol illegal? No, it really wasn't. Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah, going back to the thirties, yeah, mm -hmm. the, that was a politics thing, mm -hmm. and um you know, the Prohibition Act, but I was talking about in the 60s and 70s. Okay. Um, but there was a real big problem at the time, and that's why the ag the agency was formed in, you know, the 70s. And Yeah, 72, right? It was, a, correct, mm -hmm. July of 72. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there was so much bad liquor going around. People were dying. People were going blind. There was untaxed liquor sales going crazy, so really? it wasn't it wasn't a push against alcohol. It was a push against illegal alcohol. Okay. But then the gun control act, we got swooped up in that, and they said, "Hey, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, mm -hmm. perfect agency to enforce these." Well, these were basically new new laws, three years, four years old, mm -hmm. and they were dumped in our lap. So we had to develop policies to enforce the gun control act and the nfa and everything right what's your take on the what's your take on the second amendment let's just get that out yeah, it's probably a blunt question but um how did you look at it and how do you think that your fellow agents looked at the second amendment and i know like your viewers are going to probably start typing bull i call <laughs> bull but to a man I mean, there were the standouts that were just playing politics, or if it was a Democrat in office, they were trying to move up the ladder by being anti-gun and blah, blah, blah. And there's always those knuckleheads. You always got the 10%. But in general, ATF agents love guns, and they love the Second Amendment. They, We are the only agency. Think about it. Tell me another agency whose jurisdiction is solely based on the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Tell me one amendment that talks about the FBI or um, authorizes the FBI to do the DEA, the uh, U.S. Marshals, the, none of them. But the Second Amendment is square in our lap. Okay, okay. That's an interesting but, way to know, look at it, at least. Mm -hmm. We were not the gun police, as mm -hmm. many think. Um we, we like nothing more than to go out and get a report or a, an informant or something and then look at it and go, he's just a dude with some guns, man. Mm -hmm. We're not wasting our time on that and move on to something else. Yeah. So I think they would. So I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Sure. I think there would be some people out there that would say that the whole existence of the ATF is basically against the Second Amendment or the Constitution, right? Because it's not yeah, supposed to be any not, infringement. We have laws. Mm -hmm. Somebody is going to enforce the Gun Control Act. Look, we elect Congress. Congress passes laws. Mm -hmm. So when they pass laws or your city council passes laws or your state legislature passes laws, 
they're going to hand that jurisdiction or the enforcement responsibility to somebody. Mm-hmm. That's how the country works. Okay. Right. Uh, ultimately, was, yeah, ultimately we, we have laws. Exactly. We probably have too many. I would I'm say, I, I was going to say ultimately, you know, to make a society, you have to have laws. Okay. We probably at this stage in America have too many, but the truth is, is yes, we do have laws. Someone has to enforce that and someone has to go after the bad guys. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, and there's not not a besides drugs, there's really not a more um, worthy cause than people out there shooting people illegally with illegal guns and mm-hmm. going on and everything. That's all we were formed. We we're not out there taking nobody's guns. Okay, uh, Dan hates you. Has a wants to interject this. He says that the border patrol's authority is in the Constitution, not once but twice. <laughs> He's trying to okay. one up. <laughs> sure it is if he says so, but where? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let us know, Dan. We'll 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 flip through. Where's my Constitution? I got one here. Just let me know. Or Patrick, if you could find it. Uh, just for the sake of argument, listen, we're gun guys. We love to argue. So, um, okay, so someone has to go after the bad guys. Can you can you um, tell us what kind of bad guys you went after? Like, who oh, are these guys? Oh, the gammon. Um, you know, in the 80s, it was uh, Colombian and Peruvian and... Mm-hmm. Whatever drug dealers, cocaine mm-hmm. cowboys in South Florida shooting mm-hmm. up, you know, South Florida and Miami. Um, in the 90s, it became Crips and Bloods and mm-hmm. folk and the, all the inner city black gangs who like drew our attention, the Jamaican posses. Mm-hmm. Um, depending on where you work, you might not have any of that. You might be in Oklahoma and have a Ku Klux Klan or the White Aryan Resistance or mm-hmm. or somebody like that that you're focusing on that are creating problems around there. You might be in New York and it may be a bunch of Puerto Rican gangsters on in the Bronx doing it. It depended kind of, you know, we went where the crime was. We mm-hmm. didn't go you know, we didn't generate the crime. It's like when I was in Atlanta, it was kind of unique. It was kind of very weird. Because one of my biggest cases in Atlanta was the I Refuse Posse, mm-hmm. and we dismantled them. They were controlling and just absolutely destroying Southwest Atlanta. Okay. And uh, when we took them out, in in the weeks and months that followed, people were coming out of the project, people coming out of the low-income areas and everything, mm-hmm. hugging us and telling us, thank you for getting those guys off our street. Mm-hmm. Um and then right after that, I stepped right in. I got a good informant in the Outlaw Motorcycle Organization, mm-hmm. a purely white, you could say white supremacist mm-hmm. uh, motorcycle club, you know, a national motorcycle club. Mm-hmm. So it, it there was, I, I can't answer who we would go after except for where I was at, you know. Okay. San Francisco, we had a lot of Asian organized crime mm-hmm. going on. So okay. we would work the Asians, you know, in Chinatown and what have you. Mm-hmm. So it seems to me, from from what I've uh, seen so far in the book, that you guys were using the RICO statutes a lot, right? Is that true? Or I wouldn't say a lot. Okay. Because a RICO is manpower intensive. It's mm-hmm. time intensive. Mm-hmm. It's money expensive. Okay. So. I mean, if the target we were working at the given time put themselves in a position to be maybe subject to the RICO Act, we might spend those resources and time. Okay. Okay. So mostly you were, the the ATF was brought in because you had these, so let's say we're talking about bike gangs or um, whatever different gangs we had in different parts of the country, it was brought in to kind of like tie together the fact that maybe they were... They were uh, selling drugs or or somehow in business of violent drugs crime. and violent crimes, which involved guns, right? So that's the reason. Is that how you guys right. came guns together? Guns and or bombs. And okay. ATF was unique back to the Marine Corps scenario, mm-hmm. doing more with less. Mm-hmm. 
ATF is unique. I, I'm sure you guys have seen the movie The Untouchables. Right. Yes. Well, that was sort of the underpinning of ATF. Mm -hmm. the, the prohibition agents and what have you. And then later we became an agency. Mm -hmm. But that being said, what you noticed in The Untouchables that is true to this day and is carried on throughout our history as ATF is you send one ATF or two ATF guys into a major city and they will cultivate assets mm -hmm. with the local homicide or the local drug unit or vice or auto theft or whatever. If we see a problem, like it's going on in Chicago now, we'll come in, we'll marry up with the local PD assets and the resource because we got the big wallet Mm -hmm. the better equipment, and then we come in and we marry up and attack a given problem. That's That about the Untouchables movie was very accurate because that's what we do. Okay. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts.